Hey, this morning I want to, uh, if you'll let me, I, I want to reiterate again, if I can, this lesson here. This is our 29th study in God's plan of redemption. And I, all the way through this study, over the years of pastoring you here, I have always emphasized this reality that God is never in a hurry. And this morning I decided, I actually, just to let you know, I'm actually, too, I'm always a couple, two, three weeks ahead in my study. And this was the study I had for this morning. I had it, I was ready, I was prepared. Um, I just had not marked it up, but I was ready to go. And I sat down a couple days ago to go over it, kind of refine it like I do every every weekend. And I just started writing, and I could not stop writing about this. How long did it take God to do this? It took several thousand years, actually, 6,000 years to kind of get to where we are. But what we have been doing, and Carter, for your benefit, we, uh, the premise of this study is that, is that when God tells us that he's going to do something, that we can actually watch him do it. And so we have done that. We've gone through here. He told Abraham back here at this point right there uh, in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to make a great and mighty nation out of you. We saw 11 steps. This whole board was... Filled with that, for this right here, he made this great nation out of them. Uh, we saw that he told them after they had been uh, become a great and mighty nation, they lived in sin, that he was going to scatter them basically to the ends of the earth. And he did that. There was uh, That took about 400 years. They went into captivity with the Assyrians, Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Romans, the Greeks, all of that. We went, we've been through all of that. And then, so what do we call this right here? What do we call Abraham? What was Abraham called? Seed. Seed. Abraham is a seed. Abraham was never a nation. He was the seed of a nation. And so when we come to the New Testament, we find that he gave us another seed. And that seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, but he spoke this seed to the apostles. He said, he said uh, on this rock, on this, on, basically on his life, and with Peter being the representative, he said, I'm going to build my church. So we watch God. We, this is where we are in the story and this diagram. We watched him build his church. Uh, we have successfully watched the church decline. All right, we finished up there last week, and now we're going to sort of pick up in, into uh, the millennial period, the second coming of Christ. We'll get into that next week. That's what the other study is about. Now. I decided that this morning, if you will give me the pastoral liberty, is that I want to just shift gears for a little bit. I want to just talk to you a little bit from my heart, uh, just from my experience about this thing about God is never in a hurry. I, I, I'm assuming that if we were to evaluate, if we were just to take the time to stop, to look, to determine how we live, I think every one of us would say we're always in a what? We're always in a hurry. We've got places to go, things to do, people to meet, jobs to complete. We've got to go buy something. We've got to go shopping. We've got to get groceries. It just goes on and on and on and on. And we are always in a hurry. We live that way. Now, I want to say it in a, in a, in a way that hopefully kind of sinks in and, and makes a little bit of, of a difference. If God is never in a hurry, 
right? Did God ever get into a hurry? Anywhere. Was he ever in a hurry? Remember here in this part where Moses, where the people kind of after he delivered them out of Egypt, and that had taken probably 600 years to get there, uh, 400 years they spent in Egypt, and they sinned against God, and God just told Moses, said, look, just, let's just, I'll, I'll start over. I'm reading that, and I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? You spent all this time, and Lord, you're willing to start over? And uh, Moses prayed and begged God not to do that, not to destroy his people, and he gave them a reprieve, and, and they moved on. But God is going to do things his way, and God is never in a hurry. So the lesson that I want us to glean from this, I told you that we have, we're going to go through the scriptures a second time. We're going to look at the seven different sections of scripture in the, in, uh, from Genesis all the way through Revelation and what God says. We're looking at what God does. But if there's only one lesson, I'll say it again, if there's only one lesson that you take away from this entire study, which may be as much as 40 weeks of studying, it's that God's never in a hurry. I want to say that over and over and over and over again. I want to teach it. I want you to embrace it. I want us to understand that God is never in a hurry. You're in a hurry. I'm in a hurry. We're in a hurry. But God is never in a hurry. And I just decided, I just I kept writing. I couldn't stop writing. I said, I'm going to I'm just going to, I'm going to make this the message this morning for us. There will be things that I talk about that, you know, you might say, well, I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm just talking about this one topic, and that's perfectly fine. And so I, I, if you don't get anything else out of this series, I want you to understand that God is never in a hurry. We live in what we call this proverbial rat race, right? You ever seen a rat on the, I remember uh, going to a place where I got to see the rats and what they did and, and uh, you know, when they were testing them and stuff. And you could put a rat or a hamster in one of those little spinning things and they'd just sit there and run 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 some more. Um, we're kind of like that. We're just always going, always running, always moving, always have some place to be, always have something to actually do. We got to be here. We got to do that. We rise up early. We go to bed late. We just don't have enough time in the day. I want to say something to you, and I want, I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about this today. Uh, I probably easily could, but I'm not. Is that? I don't, it's not that we need more time. It's not that you need more time. You know what would happen if you had more time? Let's just say God could supernaturally add 10 hours to every day. So rather than 24 hours, now you have 34 hours a day. You know what you do? You would just stay, you get busier and busier and busier and do more and do more and do more. The issue is not that you don't have enough time. The issue is what you do with your time and how you prioritize your time and all of that. We always have something else to do, somewhere, somewhere to go, somebody to meet. It's in my mind, it's relentless, it's never ending, it is every day of my life. I'm going to prove to you how it affects me today. I'm going to be very personal about this. Uh, I think it's very... Uh, weary, weary, wearisome. I, I think I'm willing to say that this sort of culture that we live in 
is designed to get us to be accomplishing things, to achieve things. And it's, I want to say it to you, I want to use a strong word here. I think that all of that can be very toxic to your life, very unhealthy to your life. When you just have to, you, you're always in a hurry. You don't have time for the things that are really important. Uh, let me say it this way, for the things that really matter the most, for the things that are the most eternal. I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm not saying that you can't have projects or hobbies or that you can't uh, go play some golf or do something or, or go deer hunting or whatever it may be. I, I don't, I'm not saying that at all. But we just get so busy. Our day gets mapped out before the week even begins. I, I, I just, I have, a, I have notes, I have calendars, I have stuff on my phone to let me know where I have to be, when I have to go there, uh, who I'm meeting with, if I have to be early, if I have to take... Uh, medical records with me, whatever it, it, it may be. Some days I, I really get tired of just thinking about what I have to do and where I, I have to be. Now, I want to tell you how bad it is for me. Every morning when I get up, the first thing that I do is that I go into the living room. I get in my Lazy Boy recliner. <laughs> I get my Bible. I have my notes there that I can write down the notes when I'm when I'm just reading in the morning. But before I do anything else, I kind of map out my day. Because if I don't, when I'm reading, when I start reading and meditating on the Scripture, my mind just keeps running. I, you would think that my, your mind just wouldn't be running, but in the morning, mine is just, man, i got 10,000 things to do today. I've got to... I got to go here. I got to pick somebody up. I got to be ready to to do this. And all these things that I have to accomplish. I have so many doctor appointments. And now I've got doctor appointments for my wife, for Brenda. Uh, she she hurt her other knees. She just her, her she doesn't feel right about her lungs. There are all kinds of things going on. And sometimes I think that for those of you that go to AU Health, you were at AU Health, I think I could just go over to AU Health and pitch a tent somewhere <laughs> and just stay there and then come home. You know, just go there and spend the night so that I could get up and go to the doctors. I know exactly where the Chick-fil-A is, so I could get my <laughs> breakfast, I get my lunch, I could get my supper, I could get everything that I needed. And I, I think, that, that every morning by 7.30, I'm already exhausted trying to think about all the things that I have to do. And it, this is what I believe. It, this, this is what I believe. I honestly believe that I am mentally addicted to the list that I, I create every day. Now, I'm not telling you that you can't make a list. I'm not saying that you can't make a list. I'm going to show you my list. I'm going to show you how addicted that I am to this. Uh, but I think if I could not make my list, that I would go into something like a list withdrawal. You know, it's like an alcoholic or a dope addict that's on, on drugs and he goes, he goes somewhere to... Uh, a detoxification center. I'm, I've, all, I've wondered for a while if they have a list a detox center somewhere <laughs> that I could enjoy, that I could actually, that I could actually go to, huh? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mentally addicted to these lists, and I think that's probably sad. Now I, I just want to be. I, I want to just show you my list here. I've got all kinds of lists. It's just, but you can see that I've marked some of them off here. And I've marked some of them I haven't marked off. Because I didn't get them done. I had so much to do that day. This is a list of my medications, but I've taken a picture of that so that I can give it to every doctor that I go to that asks me. And I said, I've already given it to you. It's already on my 
my patient portal. Well, we know that, but you got anything new you're taking? No, I don't have anything new. And then I have uh, other lists. This is on paper, put string on weed eaters, move dirt from around trees, put up curtain rods at doors, advanced chiropractic in Evans. I don't, I don't know what all that's about. <laughs> I, I'm really confused, these notes, that I'm pulling them out from nowhere. pH imbalance, acidic foods, meat, cheese, eggs, grains, fish, alkaline foods, sea salt, peach, lemon, Mango, almond milk, water, apple, cider, vinegar, apples, avocado, bananas, broccoli, leafy greens. See, I got, I've got blueberries, sweet potatoes. I've got a list for what I ought to be eating. I'm, I'm addicted to these things, all right? Uh, Covington, develop course requirements for Chris on progress of redemption, which I never did, Chris. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Start subclass courses here. There's no, if I read some things here. John Bell Baptist Church. Church sign called Scotty's. See, now I've got half of them done, and some of them are on the back. Um, uh, I get Chris to do a write-up for Julie. I don't know if he's done that. You haven't done that yet, have you? No, no, no I didn't think so. So you need to get some lists. Uh, go see Miss Florence. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All kinds of stuff. I'll just take one here. This was this week. Ah... Uh, Take the blood pressure throughout the day, send checks, information to CTS, work on subsplash, start study for Sunday morning, start grading Walter Calitude thesis. I have a thesis, a doctoral thesis to grade called a Great Charlie Wilson paper, Buy Healthy Foods. I made those lists here. This is what I did on Thursday and Friday. Start, uh, start this uh, book on Threshold. Have you read the Threshold book already? Uh, I still got great Charlie's paper on here. Uh, I got to send him uh, paperwork for Brett. I've got that on here. It was on the other list. Take off the trash. Uh, prepare for Tuesday class. Notes on tactics. Um, that's a book uh, I read. Developing walking wisely. Uh, I remove part of my desk. Run off study two for my class. Close out Dollar Shave Club. I haven't done that. <laughs> uh, take camera, stand for video, Eddie's class on Tuesday, walk, dig out around trees. I read that way earlier. Oh, this is Justin Atkinson, right? Pat Smith, renew passport, uh, renew trusted traveler, Greg, Walter Calatu thesis. I've got on there. <laughs> uh, mail off the washing machine valve. I, I, that was last December. <laughs> I was supposed to send it off last December. You remember that, don't you? We ordered two of them, right? Courses uh, to enter. Call Dr. Parikh's nurse, install lights, cut grass at pool, start subsplash. How many times have I said that? Cut hose pipe, pressure wash the deck. Oh my goodness! See, I'm just—I'm addicted to this nonsense. I know. I, I know. It. I, hey, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. I can't get it all done. I just can't get it all done. I'm. I. I maybe you're different than me, and maybe you get everything done every day. I. I. I don't. I know this may sound crazy. But I was just wondering whether or not Jesus ever made list. <laughs> you know, they're out camping in Cana of Galilee somewhere, and he, he gets up real early in the morning, and he goes over to be alone, and he's got a little list, and he's got his iPhone, and he's making a list. <laughs> he's making a list of all the things that he has, has to do. I think, I'm really convinced that the real problem that Jesus had is that he didn't have an iPhone, right? He didn't. I just don't know how he was able to make it. Gary, do you prioritize these cards? What? <laughs> no, this is an addiction. This is an addiction. This is like a, uh, an alcoholic. 
I just get up every morning and I know I got things to do and I forget about the things that I didn't do and I just write down the new things and they just accumulate over a long period of time. I, I'm not good at prioritizing every, every, everything and and is there anybody else? Maybe I just maybe before I go any further, if I can ask a question, is anybody else addicted to these lists? There's one back there. I, I see don't that get hand. Any lists and I don't get anything done. <laughs> Christy, my daughter makes list upon list. And she can't go without Nobody me. else. I'm the only one here. Makes lists. <laughs> you, you make lists. I use lists. He uses a list. This is a missionary right here. He makes a list. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, 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 I make lists. The sad part is that no matter how hard I work at getting everything done on my list, that I rarely, if ever get it done. That's why it accumulates here, Bonnie. There's some days that I may have 12, 15 things on my list and honestly, I think to myself, I'll, I'll make up a list and it'll have, it'd be one like this right here. This has got 22. And I'm thinking to myself, you idiot. <laughs> there is no way on God's green earth that you will ever get through with these lists. I have to go to Augusta and pick things up, come back, you know, get some gas, go here, go down to Publix and get my, get my meds mm -hmm. down there and ask the guy about getting a shot and all that kind of stuff and head over to Aldi to pick up something for Brenda because she's not with me. I'm so addicted to my list that I make out my schedule and where I need to go first. Do I go on the way over? Do I get gas at Sam's or do I do it on the way back? And can I save some time if I do it? If I go, if I get it first or if I get it second and do I go to Panera Bread first and eat or do I just go and and, and go to Aldi and get what I want? How many times do I have to cross the traffic? Now, I want to say to you, everybody look up here for just a minute. I'm not making anything up. This is how my brain works. This is how I kind of live. Yesterday, I went to a grocery store with Eddie, and I was really happy to see that he had a list. <laughs> <laughs> and he was crossing the list out. And so... When I sit back and I realistically evaluate what all of this busyness and this hurry actually does for me, I have come to one really, really settled conclusion, and I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen very carefully to my conclusion about all of this. I have found that of all this hurry and busyness and urgency and rushing and dashing to and fro at some frenetic pace does one really big thing for me. Nothing. Nothing. I've got nothing in capital letters in my notes. Did you know that there is not one place, I'll mention it later, there's not one place in the New Testament, listen carefully, where Jesus ever got into a hurry. You can't find it. I read through the Gospels every day. I mean, I'm reading in the Gospels every day as a part of, as a part of my devotions. And I honestly, with all the hurry and all the busyness and all the coming and going and having to be here and do that and pick this up and send that off and mail this and get that and go to the grocery store and get gas and all of that, I cannot actually find anything in my life that says I'm better off.
What I'd like to do is learn how to slow down. Amen. That's what I really want to do. Why? Because God's never in a hurry. If I'm in a hurry, there's a good chance that there's something that I'm missing spiritually that God wanted me to learn, and I didn't learn it. I missed it. I'll tell you what it is here in just a minute. I, I don't think I, we went to the dry cleaners yesterday. I don't think I saved 10 minutes going to the dry cleaners before we went to Walmart. In fact, in some way, this being in a hurry is like an enemy in my life. It's like a thief in my life. In its own strange way, it is always dragging me away, distracting me from doing, I think, at times, what is the most important thing to do with my life, or the most important kind of things that God would want me to do. If I'm not careful, trust me, but everything that I think that I have to do will completely distract me and sidetrack me from doing the things that I know spiritually are the most important for my life. And when I get up at the 38,000 foot level and I look down on my life and I look down on your life, here's what I realize is that people are so busy that they don't have any time for God. They don't know how to read the scriptures. They don't even know how to read a book. I have so many students, uh, Eddie, you can validate this. I have so many students over the years that they will come up to me and they'll say something like this. I don't like to read. I don't like to read. Man, you better start learning how to read because there's a lot of things that you don't know. And there are a lot of people that are a lot smarter than you are and if you're going to be a teacher and if you're going to be a leader, I told him in class this last week on Tuesday night, I said, great leaders are always great readers. Somebody like Albert Moeller, who's the president of Southern Theological Baptist Seminary, he, he may read one or two books a day. I try to read two books a week. I can't imagine what it would be like. Now, he's talking about a speed reader. He's a junk reader there. I mean, he, I don't know what he does. Every day I read through the Bible systematically, but I always start by reading in the Gospels first. I start with the Gospels, and then I go, this is my methodology, I go to the Gospels first, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I include Acts with that. They're the historical narrative, right? They're the story. And then I go to the epistles. Right now I'm in Revelation. It's my second. And then I go to Proverbs, which is I read the day, the date that I'm, I'm on. You know, this is the Friday was the 13th, 14th. Today's the 15th. That's what I will read today in Proverbs. Is Proverbs chapter 15. And then I, I'm reading in Leviticus. We talked about Nadab and Abihu and off, offering strange fire to the Lord. And then his brothers, uh, I guess it was a holy and somebody else, I forget. And this all the issues that they had with uh, eating there in Leviticus chapter 6 and 7. And all that kind of stuff. And then, as I have read through the Gospels, it has... Everybody listen carefully. I'm making a point. As I read through the Gospels every day, and have been doing this for years, this has been the habit of my life for 40, 45 years. I don't break this habit. It's the best habit that I have. I've never found one time that Jesus ever got into a hurry.
I'm going to say that again. I had never found one single time in the Gospels when Jesus got into a hurry. Everybody else was in a hurry, and he'd stop them. He'd slow them down. I'll give you a couple of examples of that here in just a minute, where Jesus just said, well, no, no, we're not going to do that. I want you to go to Luke chapter 8, if you don't mind. Luke chapter 8. I'm going to just read you this one story here. I'll read you a couple. Luke chapter 8. This is a story about Jairus. And I'm, I'm just going to start in verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, everybody's just waiting on him. They just they, they want to get him busy. Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Now, notice what takes place. So he decides he's going to go. But as he went, as he was going, the multitudes thronged him. They wanted him to do something for them. And now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? Now, you've got to get the picture here. I want you to think about this story as if you are Jairus. You're Jairus. Chris, you could probably come up with some stories from being an EMT and being on the ambulance and stuff and lights blaring and glaring and cars behind them. they got their lights blinking and following they got to get to the hospital and Jairus is sitting there and his daughter is at the point of death and he knows that there's nobody else that's going to be able to help her but Jesus and he, he he's in a hurry he's walking really fast to show him where the house is you know have you ever been late somewhere and you're, and you're driving to get there and because you left late, you speed up, you go faster? If your daughter was dying, I remember one night we were at church and my wife calls me, and this is when Patience was very young, and she said, you got to get home right now. you got to get home right now. Patience is blue. She's turned blue. And then she stopped breathing for a while. Blah, blah, blah. You think I went the speed limit going home? That's no. Man, I got in my car. I floored it. I got to the house. I think the ambulance had come and, and there. And, and you made it, baby. I'm really, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you're doing really good. Uh, because you know it. <laughs> I, I didn't know if you knew that. But no. <laughs> and Jesus just stops the whole parade. They're kind of moving down the road, and he just sort of stops, and he, he says, who touched me? And it's like, what? I mean, now, if you're Jairus, you've got to just think what, what, what's going on in his mind at the moment. He says, are you kidding me? The crowds are just, the multitude, everybody's reaching out to touch you. There's hundreds of people here that are reaching out to touch you as you're walking here. And you, you stop this thing. I'm in a hurry. My daughter is dying. And I don't know if we're going to be able to get there. And then all of a sudden, the story says that somebody came and said, don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. You know what Jesus did? 
he spoke a word here. If you go through and he says, uh, um, he says in verse 50, when Jesus, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he turned around, he looked, he answered him saying, do not be afraid. Only believe she will be made well. Sometimes I'm going to say to you that you get in, you'll find yourself, I don't care what kind of hurry you're in, and Jesus wants to reduce all of that to one thing, to something in his word. That's the only thing, that's the only hope that Jairus had was that Jesus, Jesus says, don't be afraid. She will be made well. I mean, I think J.R.S. is sitting there and he's thinking, man, I, we got to go. We got to go, yes. Yeah, I used to tell people, they'd be all freaked out in the back of the ambulance, like, do you see me worrying? No, then don't worry, I got it. Got it. Do you see me worrying? Okay, worry. <laughs> Until then, don't worry about it, I got it. Amen. John chapter 11, if you'll turn there, this is the story about Lazarus. You know the story. The story about Lazarus. And said a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. I'm going to start with verse 1. In the town of Mary, and uh, he was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now just remember that right there. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through me. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, He hopped on the chariot. He got the fastest white horse that there was, kind of the Uber of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, he hopped in it. He told him, we got to get there, wherever it was. Bethany, I said the Uber of Bethany. We got to get there. He camped out for two days where he was. Mm -hmm. And you know what they came back and told him? They said, well, Lazarus died, buddy. Way to go. Great thinking. You could have healed him. I, I don't get it. Right? And Jesus said to them, he's not dead. All of this is for the glory. You know, sometimes I think I'm going to, I'm spiritualizing here, so y'all forgive me, I, I, I got my hermeneutics down, but I understand. I think sometimes that God will just slow you down so that he can get the glory. That's what he did here with Lazarus. Are you kidding me? Wait two more days? Jesus, come on. Lazarus is dying. Waiting is simply not on my menu today. They're not offering that today. Listen very carefully, and please listen to my heart on this. Okay? I'm driving this home. I'm doing it in a different way. This is not like a Bible study. This is just Gary. Talking, pressing, pushing, encouraging to strengthen you to understand that God is never in a hurry. I want you to listen to what I say. I want, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Not one time is it recorded that Jesus ever got into a hurry. Not one time. 
There has to be a lesson there. Just speaking from the silence of Scripture, there has to be a lesson there that Jesus never really got into a hurry. I wonder why that is. I wonder what He knew that we don't know or maybe that we've just ignored and, uh, and, and that we have missed. And I wonder if He understood if he just absolutely understood that his father never got into a hurry. Yes, he understood that. And that's why he lived the way that he lived. It's because he knew that his father never got into a hurry. I, I want to say it one more time, but this thing of always being in a hurry in your life, of always having to be somewhere, of always having to have something to do. That over a period of time, all of that will literally dismantle your spiritual life. It will take it apart piece by piece. Because you don't have time for God, but you have time for everything else. It just dismantles your spiritual life and you don't even know it. it it's like a slow-growing cancer in your life. It will hurt you. It will hurt your family. It will hurt your children. It will hurt the people that you loved. And most of all, it will damage you. It will hurt your fellowship with God. In my mind, it's a kind of cultural curse that unfortunately we have embraced in this thing about the rat race and always being in a hurry and living by the clock. You know, it was really interesting uh, when we, when Tim and Eddie and I were all in, when we were in Zimbabwe, they don't have clocks. Nobody has got an eye watch. I didn't. I have an eye watch. I'm not wearing it today. They, 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 they don't have a clock. You can't just say, "Well, we're going to have Bible study at 9:30 under this tree." Nobody knows exactly when 9:30 is, and certainly, so they just go through the village and blow the horn, and people two, three miles away, it's like. It's like the Indians doing the smoke things, you know. Next thing you know, you got 40 people there, and next it's 50, and then it's 70, and then it's 120, and by the end of the day, you got 180 people under the tree. They live a different way than we do. We call it the new normal. We have time for everything else. Everybody listen to me. Look up here just for a minute. You do what you want to do. You go where you want to go. You live at the pace that you want to live at. We all do. I do. We, we, we make time for what we want to make time for. We have time for everything else, every activity, every goal, every interest, every hobby, every endeavor that we want to pursue, but we have seem to have no time in this culture in which we live. We have no time to just simply be still and know that I am God. Just be still. You cannot be still in a rat race. Corey Tin Boom. You remember anything about her? Some of you may not know who she was. She was, she was captured under Hitler, and and uh, she and her family, and her mother and her father, and they hid people in in their house. They finally got caught, but she said that if the devil cannot make you sin, he will do everything he can to make you busy. Mm -hmm. It would just get you busy. 
Do you know what this constant busyness and hurry does to our life? It's really very simple. If I listen, you all write this down and take it notes. All of the hurry and all of the busyness and all of the got to be here and I got to be there. Here's what it does. It disconnects me from God. It disconnects me. It's like pulling the plug out of the, out of the electric socket. It disconnects my life from the life of God. We have no time for God because we're too busy. We're always in a hurry. Listen, say it with me. God is never in a hurry. Why should I be? Well, i got things to do. You know what happens when you get really busy? You get overloaded. <laughs> I, I got so many things, I just need to probably just take these home and throw them away. I'm addicted to it. I gotta, that's how I live. You get overloaded, and when you get overloaded, it marginalizes the time that you have to have a relationship with people, people in your family your children, your loved ones, your friends. I made a commitment to myself. He doesn't know this, but I made a commitment to myself after we met Carter on a Sunday afternoon and went to see him in the hospital at AU Health that I was going to be his friend and I was going to go see him and spend time with him and I didn't care what else I had to do. I could hardly wait for him to get back from Atlanta and all the rehab that he had. You get overloaded and now I want you to listen carefully. Here's what happens when we're so busy that we have no time for God. We become much more worldly. This ought to be obvious. Mm -hmm. We just become more worldly because we are rarely in God's word except for maybe just a short time. We really don't know what God has to say. I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I'm not going to ask anybody, but if you had to write down on a sheet of paper how much time you spend in the word of God on a daily basis, I wonder what it would be. In a week, how much time would you spend just spending time alone with God? So we begin to think like the world thinks and much less like God thinks. Here's the bottom line. Unless you spend time with God, you will never live like God. You will never think like God. I want to think like God, right? Here's what I know about God. God's never in a hurry. I'm going to drive that point home to me, not just to, to you. I want to put that stake in, in the ground here. If you don't spend time with God, you'll never think like God. And the result is that you will develop cultural ideas and concepts and philosophies about your life and what's important. And before you know it, you're chasing after all of the wrong things. That's what happens. We start chasing after all the things that we think that we need and that we want and that are going to give us the life that we really are looking for and they lead us to the exact opposite place. They put us in the exact opposite direction. They create a direction for our life that's probably not at all where God wants us to go. They don't have any eternal value, things that actually hurt your life and steal your life away from you. And suddenly you find that you are addicted to things that just do not matter. Mm -hmm. You become like me. You become like the guy addicted to these cards over here. You become addicted to the things that don't really matter in your life. I know that this may sound a little strange and eccentric, just forgive me, but I just do not believe that God created hurry.
I don't know what you believe. I'm not sure the word hurry is in his vocabulary. I, I know this. I know that he's never been in a hurry. Can you imagine all of the things that Jesus had to do in just three short years? I guess if we took the time this morning, and I, I can't do it, I, I probably won't get through. If, if he had to write everything down, if we had to write everything down that he had to do and, and outlined it and how he had to reach people and make disciples and feed the sick and heal the hungry and find the lost, I think we'd be a little overwhelmed with what he had to do. He had to take the this ragtag bunch of disciples, these men that all they really knew how to do were, was to fish or something or a tax collector, people that didn't know anything about what he was doing. That they were a ragtag bunch of nobodies and he had to create the biggest paradigm shift in their life that they would ever had. I'm going to tell you what that paradigm shift was. Now these are guys that really, you know, Luke may or Luke wasn't an apostle, but he was a historian. But I don't think that any of these guys really had much of an education. I think they all just kind of regular folk like us, you know, regular people. They just. They were just trying to make a living in an agrarian economy, and they were just doing the very best that they could, and and uh, it was a struggle. And Jesus kind of calls them out, and He has to create this paradigm shift. I'm developing a course. I'm going to teach it here on Matthew five two seven. I'm going to call it the Great Paradigm Shift. Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. Here's the paradigm shift. He had to take them from fishing for fish to fishing for men. Mm Now, I want to say to you, I want you to listen carefully. I want you to hear my heart as your pastor. I'm sure that God probably has a paradigm shift for all of us that he wants to take us from fishing for X, whatever it is, to fishing for men. I don't know what you're fishing for, right? What you have to have, what you can't do without, but you just believe that you, you just got to have, you got to have all of this. Jesus had to live a perfect life. He had, was always having to do the will of his father. He had to prepare to die at a very early age in the weight of all of the world's sins and my sins and your sins. They were on his shoulders and if he didn't do it and if he just kind of messed up and he got out of alignment just one time, that everything would just be ruined. This is... This is, uh, but you know what he did? I know this is going to sound like it doesn't even fit in this message. You know what Jesus did? You're going to say, Gary, how in the world does this even fit in here? I'm not really sure you have to. This is what Jesus did. He walked everywhere that he went. I walk around the field and I don't walk real fast and the gnats are so big that they'll carry me over into the woods so that coyotes can eat me. But I don't try to walk too fast and ah, I, you know I have a great time just walking. There's nobody out there with me except the gnats and sometimes the dogs. They'll, they'll run up. I have some, I carry my little things for them. Little dog bones. Jesus walked everywhere that he went. There, there were no corporate jets, no nice cars, no trains. 
no chauffeur, no nothing. He walked everywhere he went except for just a couple of times when we know that he rode on a, the, probably the slowest animal possible, a donkey. Wasn't very fast. Now, I have a word that I want to insert here to help describe what is happening. We have become, I want to make sure I say it the right way, we have become culturally and digitally distracted. Digitally distracted. Remember all the things I put on the board last week about how many times, how many hours a week, how many, how many, how many, 10,000 hours that a young person spends before he gets to 21 just playing video games and the 707 hours that an adult spends in a year just scrolling through. All of the social media, television, four hours a day, <clears throat> normal. Ah, I was so conscious all that. Nonsense this week, it just bothered me. I, I just didn't feel, I, I can't go watch TV right now. <laughs> you know, got crazy. We're so distracted doing things that do not matter that we have no time. We have absolutely no time. We have great trouble finding time to do the things that do. We all need a paradigm shift. So we need Jesus to kind of insert something in our life that gets us back on plane and gets us in alignment with what he says. Listen, I'm not really concerned. Everybody listen to me. I'm not really concerned that any of you will renounce the faith. I, I want to say it this way. If I were to, I, I probably should write it up here, but I want to. If, the faith is that it's what you believe. It's that body of doctrine. It's those truths and those principles that each of us uh, have integrated into our life. I, I believe I believe things about God and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about the church and about the end times and all of that kind of stuff. I there's doctrine. I've taught on it for years and years and years to 29, almost 30 years. I'll start my 30th year here on October the 1st. 30 years. I've taught on these things. I've taught on those doctrines. I've taught on the difference between reform, non reform doctrine, the, the, the tulip, whatever it may be. I've done all of that, and that is this body of doctrine that we call the faith. And I'm not really. Concerned that any of you are going to renounce the faith. That's not the issue. The issue is that we have become so busy and so hurried in our life. It's not that we're going to renounce the faith. It's that we're going to ignore the faith. We're just going to ignore it. We, we just, we're too busy. I don't have time. It's, man, it's 11 o'clock already. I've got to get up at 4.30. What time do you get up in the morning? 4.30. 4 yeah, that's why I was doing good. That's early, right? I mean, that, 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 that's early to get up. Let me say it in a different way, just to make the point, rather than developing this vibrant faith that literally controls and dominates our life, we become so busy doing other things that we become satisfied with a, just a mediocre faith, a marginal faith. Not the faith, but our personal faith. I have a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want that to be worked out of my life and worked into my life, and I want it to reflect, I want my life to reflect exactly what it is I say that I believe, that, but I can be so busy and going so fast, and I'm not going to renounce the faith, I'm not going to turn away from Christ, but I'm going to marginalize my own personal faith. Without faith, not the faith, without your personal faith, it's impossible to even please God. Correct. I'm 
person who's always in a hurry has so many things to do, their Christianity just loses its spiritual edge. They wouldn't know how to talk to somebody about Jesus and be a fisherman a minute if their life depended on it. And you may be wondering why in a study like this that is focused completely from beginning to end for 28 studies that we've focused completely on the historical narrative. And here I am, I've digressed into this dialogue on always being in a hurry. Well, it's really simple. If we get to this place, if we get this far, if I've spent 29 weeks, if I've spent over a half of a year doing all of this and getting us to this place, and we still haven't figured out that God is never in a hurry, then I don't think that anything I can teach you will ever have any impact or any benefit on your personal life. You might say, well, that's a little over, overboard. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm just trying to help you to think a certain way. God's never in a hurry. You may, I begged you to tattoo this onto your brain, right? This is the Bible. This is what the Bible is. It's a story. It's, it's God's story. It's His story, history. It's, it's a picture of what God has done. It's just so simple. I, I have this as tattooed on my brain. I see it. I, I don't even have to think about it. It's just, it's just there. This, this diagram literally changed my life. I mean, this whole, this whole study changed my life years and years ago, probably 35 years ago. It just completely changed my life. I'm committed to it, and I'm committed to teaching that to you and to repeating it to you until it makes a, a significant difference. In your life, I'm committed to learning how to live this way, and I want you to embrace it as well. You may not choose to, but at least I'm trying to reinforce it for you. I've been trying to figure out all of the things that being in a hurry does to my life. One word that I just have not been able to get out of my mind is the word toxic. Always being in a hurry is toxic to my spiritual life. It's toxic to my relationship with God and to the relationship that I have with other people. And worst of all, it, it's, it, it's, it, it, it damages, it somehow impacts in my fellowship with God when I'm just in so big of a hurry. In the morning I get up and I got all these things to do and places to go and I got a meeting to be at and I've got to go to this pastor's meeting and I got to be at the doctor and I got to get a, a, a chest x-ray and I got to go get my I got to get my blood work done and the lady's got to give me an infusion and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and it never stops it's toxic to me how many people do you know who constantly say something like this you want them to do something you want to go somewhere just sit down have a nice meal just I and they say, I just don't have time. You ever said that? I've certainly said that. What strikes me so clearly about Jesus is that he always had time for people. God reaches people through people, right? People hear when you talk. Somebody's going to listen. The fields are white for harvest. I just don't have enough. The laborers are few. There are not enough people out there that are willing to go and to share and to communicate the gospel to somebody so that they can actually come to Christ. Just don't have time. I want you to go to John chapter 14. It's just, uh, uh, just turn the page there, a couple pages. Verse 6, this is a page, uh, a, a verse that we all know. You don't mind waiting, letting me get through today? Anybody? Got to be somewhere? 
John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, just take the evangelism out of that and make the practical side of it. There's something here. I think if we really exegete this passage the way that it could possibly be exegeted. I'd have to work on my hermeneutics. It would say something like this. This is my translation, all right? I just wrote this down. I, I translated it myself, so you can adjust it. But this is what it's saying. Jesus is saying, look at me. So you can see the way to live. I am the life. You want life? Just look at me. Look at me so that you can see what truth looks like when it's lived out in a person's life. I am the way. I am the truth. Just look at me. I, I, I am, I'm what truth is all about. And look at me so that you can really and truly enjoy the kind of life that God wants to give to you. Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying, he's saying to them, I am the way that I want you to live, just look at me. Just live like me. I know that sounds kind of simplistic because that's what will draw you to the Father. That's what will draw you into the Father's presence. That's, that's what is how God has designed you to live. Just look at me and then live like I live. Wow, here's the problem. When it comes to God, the more of a hurried life that you choose to live, the more that the fellowship that you want with God will be destroyed. If you want this life, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Just look at me. If you want that life, if you want the benefit of those things in your life, You've got to slow down. One author that I read said it kind of this way. I thought this was great. They said, love takes time, but hurry does not have any time. Mm. Mm. Love takes time, but hurry does not have any time. The more hurried you become, the less you will appreciate what the people that surround your life are doing for you. Every time I go into Walmart or down to Publix, whoever I'm talking to, I don't care if it's the, I don't care who it is, it's the person in the aisle that's putting up some cans or the lady at the aisle that is checking me out or if it's the pharmacist, I'm going to be as gracious and as kind to them as I possibly can be. They probably had a really, really bad day. Dealing with people like us. Mm, mm, mm. I want to say to you that the more hurried you become, the less wisdom you will have. I want to tell you why you will have less wisdom. This is important. It's because wisdom is not something that you can get in a hurry. It's not in a pill. You can't just pop a pill and have wisdom. You can't just have one event happen in your life and you be a wise person. You become a wise person over an extended period of time wisdom is not something that you can just get hurried the more hurried you become the less wisdom that you are going to have you can't get it in a hurry unless you're so stubborn that you have to learn everything the hard way here's what wisdom does everybody listen carefully wisdom simply makes you wait for wisdom it makes you wait Wisdom is in no hurry to give you wisdom. It wants you to seek it. It wants you to wait on it. It wants you to earn it. And always having to be in a hurry can destroy almost everything in your life that should be important to you. Listen to me. Everybody listen carefully. It can destroy your marriage. I do a lot of marriage counseling, unfortunately. 
We got people, we got husbands and wives that are going in completely opposite directions. Both of them working, they got kids, they got to have them down to the, to the place you keep kids, the nursery, they got to do this, they got to get them to school, they got to pick them up, they got, everybody understand what I'm talking about? And you're just going and you're working and your schedule is different and you work at night and they work, they work in the day and you just kind of cross in the night and you don't see each other and next thing you know you wonder why your marriage is not working can destroy your relationship with your people. You don't ever have any time for your children. They're the victim. And destroy your fellowship with God is too busy. What you give your attention to is ultimately what you become is how you live. and a half maybe I don't know if you can endure that we're okay but it's your cardio you okay hmm? you gotta be home you gotta be home at one yeah, yeah. yeah. stuff okay. I'm gonna stop I'm not gonna get in a hurry <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say something. Uh, it goes back to my mother being in the hospital and how she um, said, well, I'm ready to go. I'm ready for the Lord to come get me. I said, and through your teaching, I'm like, you know, you never have heard. <laughs> he has a plan. And we have to wait on him. Amen. And, and there's a reason. And as the days, the weeks went on, I said, Mom, you know, there's many reasons that he's waiting. One being, uh, it gave the grandchildren time to sit with her and her to witness to them her love for, for Jesus. Um, for them to have that fellowship with her. And then number two, it gave Chris and I the opportunity to talk to all the hospital staff. I can't tell you how many times we spoke about the Lord. Amen. You're a captive audience. They have to be there. 